being pursued. Uh, there's legislation that's been filed that's slated to be passed in the next couple of weeks, we hope, that would allow for the creation of it. It doesn't create it, it allows for the creation of it. And it's up to each town meeting to vote to whether or not they want to join it. And, and the way it works is the legislation sets the framework. It doesn't say how anything's supposed to work. The way things work is in the, the, the details of that is in an operating agreement. And so if we get to the point of uh, voting uh, whether or not you'd like to join DHY Community Partnership, what you're really saying is we really need to know the details of what that agreement, operating agreement, say. Because uh, that governs our participation, the sharing of costs, and things like that. And so what that looks like, so this is our eight phases for our town. This is our phase one, which is just setting us up to do all future phases. And we could send it here on our own, or if you did the DHY option, this is a broader map showing the three towns of Dennis, Harwich, and Yarmouth. Har uh, Harwich and Dennis have been very flexible in, in dealing with the Yarmouth's uh, plans. They've changed up their phasing so that if Yarmouth's phase one is going, Dennis has a phase one and Harwich has a phase one at the same time. Likewise, our phase two and threes align so that we're all adding into a plant, which under the concept would be to host at the DPW site in Dennis. So instead of our main pipe down here on 28 going to Buck Island Road, we still have that main pipe that is gonna be the main trunk line for all future phases, but it just goes down uh, Route 28, most likely up 134 or some of the side streets leading to 134 to the Dennis plant where it gets treated and effluent comes back. And right now we're looking at the Bass River Golf Course site as the site for effluent recharge. Um, so those are the main two options that we're considering. There's some opportunities perhaps with the town of Barnstable, um, but at the moment with the estimates we have, those seem to be more expensive options. And so the goal here is to minimize the cost and we think by working regionally, we have an opportunity to do that. Um, the Water Resource Advisory Committee met uh, Monday and one of the exercises that we've been going through uh, with Kathy Williams has taken a, le taken a lead on is determining how much flow that we want to provide to a potential plant. And so, uh, from as the planning board, I'm, I'm sure that would be important information for you. Um, I'll let Kathy speak to that. But the, we've done some outreach aside from that. And um, the main, larger event, largest event we've done so far was at the Cultural Center back in June. And the main question we get on the outreach is I think by and large people are positive, supportive, they realize the need. It all comes down to how, how much does it cost and how do we pay for it? And so in the packet of, that was from the selectmen, there's some information on that. Some of that is still uh, in the works as to finalizing the details of this. But we do have some conceptually some ideas how we can pay for it. And we've met the goal of the Board of Selectmen, at least at the moment, um, of doing so without impacting the tax rate. And so this handout, uh, this presentation to the Suckman is on our website. So if anybody in the public is inclined to want to review this, you can go to our website and go to the Water Resource Advisory Committee page. There's a link right on our home page to get there. And you can look at this information that I'm going over. And it's also in the uh, Board of Suckman's video from their meeting from July 30th. But we're relying on a couple of big estimates and uh, it's on the page called Phase One Cost Estimates. The total Phase One at the moment, uh, we're anticipating costs of about $112 million. And we're also anticipating that we'd be able to belong to the state's SRF revolving loan program. And we're pretty, uh, we feel confident that we'd be able to get a 0% loan. They do offer subsidies but that's a much more competitive process you can get, and that program changes a lot more frequently than 
so we didn't want to assume that, but we are assuming in our estimates here that we can qualify and get the 0% loan, which on $112 million over 30 years saves us upwards of $35 million on the project. And we feel that probably by participating in a regional alternative gives us a better shot at qualifying for um, a subsidy or a 0%. Uh, so that's an important estimate and presumption that we have to achieve. Uh, but that $112 million over 30 years comes to $3.73 million per year on a bond debt service cost, similar to a mortgage. And so the idea is to be able to pay for that $3.7 million each year without hitting the general tax rate. And so, but just as a frame of reference, if it were all on the tax rate, which isn't the, the goal here, it would be $64 per $100,000 of valuation. So for your average or median home of roughly $300,000, we're talking about $192 per year additionally. If you're talking a, a million dollar home, we're talking $640. But the next page is kind of show this chart in particular. Four general areas where we think we can recover with some costs and how we can do that. And it breaks it down so that we, if we can achieve these goals and these results, that we're not hitting the tax rate at all, and it's not costing $64 per 1,000 on the tax rate, 100,000 on the tax rate, it's costing zero. It still has to be paid for, of course. Uh, so the first area is user-generated revenues, contributing about 30% of the $3.7 million annual cost. So that's about $1.1 $1 .1 million a year. And that consists of um, a betterment that we're proposing, of, which basically is the goal of achieving about 20% of our collection system cost of the pipe going down Route 28 would be assessed to those that have to connect up to the system. We're considering phase one largely a commercial phase. And when we talk to the, we do our outreach with, our, with all our commercial neighbors, uh, they don't seem to be flinching at the idea of a betterment because they're incurring significant costs now with on-site treatment systems and ongoing annual maintenance. Um, we still have to craft that betterment program, and as we craft it, we we're considering that we're gonna uh, develop it on the basis of flows, so that those that use more are paying more, and it also give us the opportunity to perhaps exclude a base amount, for example, say 70,000 gallons per year, which represents an average household use. So therefore, if you're an average household, maybe we could do a little bit more. Uh, you wouldn't be paying a betterment because we've excluded that first amount first. Uh, the other thing that goes into this user-generated revenue is a, uh, a search, capital surcharge on the operating rate. So just like water has a rate that you pay a certain amount per gallon for water, you'd also pay a certain amount per gallon for wastewater. And just for ease of discussion here, if it was $100 was your rate, we're contemplating a 25% surcharge on that, or $25 be collected just to pay this debt service. And so that results in about $625,000 that we, could, we anticipate we could collect in total for all users in this phase one. So those two things, the betterment and the 25% and the capital surcharge add up to about 1.1 million. The next item is the Water Infrastructure Investment Fund. And so we've been talking for a while that in the year 2020, we have an opportunity to change or amend the surcharge we have related to CPA. And so the contemplation here, and this will be in front of the Board of Selectmen with the CPC and the Water Resource Advisory Committee for discussion, is perhaps we could split that 3% current CPA, 3% surcharge to a 1.5% for the Water Infrastructure Fund and a 1.5% for the CPA. So the total surcharge is the same as it's always, or has been for the last 20 plus years of 3%. So representing no new additional tax burden, but basically repurposing or reallocating it how you're using it. And that would generate about a million dollars per year, or about 28.5% of what we need. I've been spending a lot of time looking through our local receipts and our local budget, and the big change that's come up for next year is with a new short-term rental tax, where um, Historically, we've taxed at 6% locally hotels, motels for uh, visits, rentals. 
that local tax now can, is attributed to Airbnbs and other private rentals. And so we have some estimates of what that's going to deliver, and I'm using the mid-range of that estimate of about $570,000. And in addition, we have some solar projects that are coming online this year. Uh, a big one over at 50 Workshop Road where our septage plan is, a one megawatt uh, ground mount solar system, and some uh, roof-mounted solar on our fire stations. And we think we're gonna be able to achieve about $125,000 of savings by those projects and we want to repurpose those for, for wastewater funding. So if we can achieve that 570 for our short-term rental tax, new short-term rental tax, and for our solar projects, that's 695,000, which is about 16.5% of the total we need. And the final component, which is the least certain of all of this because we don't know how it's gonna shake out yet, is along with that legislation that allows us to tax locally the Airbnbs and other private rentals, it added 2.75%. Uh, collected by the state to all those rentals as well. And that money goes into Cape and Islands Water Protection Trust. And we have to, it's still to be determined how that money is going to be distributed back to each community. Uh, but most communities are working with a planning number of about hopefully 25% on any projects that you're projecting that you would have. And so that's what we've used for just under a million dollars. So there's a lot of moving parts here. We've worked hard to find those moving parts and put them together into a plan. We think it's a, a practical and realistic plan, but the devil's in the details in actually achieving this. But if we can, we're funding a, a little bit of a surplus each year, 3.8 million, when we, with our need about just over 3.7 million. Um, also part of our plan would be to start this next fiscal year, which gives us a couple years to build up a little bit of a surplus that would help carry us through if we can't achieve these results and help stabilize any financing we have of the, of the debt service when it finally comes on board in, in the year 2025. So that's a quick and dirty run through of the financing of it, uh, the status of where we are. The one other map I have here that I just wanna share with you. One other reason why it's important, that we're, or one of the reasons we're considering this now, the, an important consideration, is the state has several projects lined up for Route 28 that it would like to complete. And it's four, at least four in particular in Yarmouth. And if we can coordinate our phase one collection system plans with the state road work, we can save some substantial money by basically just picking up the incremental costs of putting that pipe in the ground. The state would cover um, the paving and all that good stuff. But more importantly, if the state digs up Route 28 and does one of these projects, there's a five-year moratorium on touching that road again, which means if we don't do this in coordination with their planned projects in the next two and three years, we're waiting another essentially 10 years to, before we can do this again. And so the biggest thing that impacts our ability to pay for this is really inflation. If we had done this back in 2011, as opposed to 2022, and what we're contemplating now, uh, that inflation pretty much would have paid for our, for our phase one that we're contemplating now. You can't find enough revenue to offset that in co in cost inflation. With that, um, I'd be happy to take any questions you have. And then Dave Young um, from CDM Smith is the engineer for the town and also for Dennis and Harwich, so um, he's been helping to uh, coordinate our efforts on that DHY partnership and he's in attendance as well. And also Kurt C. as the chairman of the RAC committee, two gentlemen would like to come to the table and maybe share in some of the conversation relative to Rich's presentation. That would be helpful for the, for the board. Okay, we'll open it up to uh, questions. Lee? No. You've heard this before, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, I'd like to say I, I, I haven't really expressed this before, but Rich, I. The, the whole team has done a great job, but you in particular have done a, done a fantastic job hanging in there and really uh, it's from the beginning 10 months ago to now has made a big difference. Thank you. I agree difference. as well. Outstanding work. Um, I had a couple questions. One, what does the Water Resources um, Advisory Committee 
expect out of the Planning Commission working our way up to the town meeting? So, and maybe Dave and Kurt might comment, but I guess I'll start it off. Um, trying to anticipate the questions that might arise, and so the Planning Board addresses lots of those potential questions, whether it's the concern that this is gonna spur on a lot of development and we're gonna turn into something we don't want it to be, uh, that's probably the main concern. And, and, and we understand the question, but we think there's lots of things in place to uh, account for that, so to speak. So one of the biggest thing is the land use controls that we'd be required to put in place to participate in these SRF program, which is you've gotta determine basically now, which is the work that Kathy has done, uh, what's the flows that you're gonna project uh, currently, but also do you want to provide for any additional surplus so that you can do some development? And how much is the right number? Because it costs you to buy in that, that capacity. Um, but our local zoning also doesn't go away either. If you can't build a high-rise motel on Route 28 now, you're not going to be able to do it just because we have sewers either. Um, so those are some of the planning questions. I'm sure there's others that Dave and Kirk can speak to. Well, no, I think, uh, Rich, you hit the, uh, the key number or the key component, and that is, you know, in order to qualify for the 0% interest loan, which you've heard the numbers quoted, which means significant dollars to the town, um, you're going to have to adopt land use controls. That's one of the five criteria that's required uh, to qualify for 0% interest. That's often the toughest hurdle that a community faces for um, adopting them. Um, but it's really to make sure that you have a plan in place uh, to manage to the flow that you've put forth uh, in your comprehensive wastewater management plan that the uh, State Department of Environmental Protection, the environmental agencies at the, uh, MEPA, and the Cape Cod Commission will be approving once you uh, resubmit your plan. So. I had another question posed to me by a, a resident that Wants to, wants to support this program I was talking to just this morning. And the question was, in breaking out the CPA funds, the one, per, one and a half and the one and a half, which is what you were, you've been talking about so far, um, what is the process for that? Does that, does that have to go, uh, the selectmen have to agree to it, I, I understand, but does that go on the warrant as well? It would, so um, actually, uh, I don't think I've sent it to you yet, but it'll probably go out to the Water Resource Advisory Committee tomorrow and to the general public next week, uh, a write-up on what that process is, what it is we're talking about and what the process is. So we're talking about the Water Infrastructure Investment Fund, uh, where it's really its own thing. You can raise up to 3% surcharge, independent of whatever you're doing with CPA, and put that money into a fund that's dedicated for water, stormwater, and wastewater uh, maintenance and improvement projects, essentially. Um, in order to do that, it's a similar process as to voting CPA. You need an article at town meeting uh, to adopt it, and you need to identify the percentage you'd like to adopt, and then it goes into effect whatever date you identify to put it into effect, or generally the year after you, you vote to have it. So in our case, um, there is a consideration, the selectmen still have to decide what the warrant for this upcoming special town meeting is going to include, but one of the considerations is do we want to vote on that at town meeting uh, this upcoming October? And so as part of that process, uh, Dave and uh, Kurt and I have already been in front of the CPC just to make them aware, because even though it is a, a separate thing, just because you do a surcharge on the water infrastructure fund doesn't mean you have to do anything on the CPA surcharge. But we do understand the desire out there to have no increase in taxes, so right. typically what we would understand you know, somebody might propose is if we're gonna add to the surcharge on water infrastructure, we would take away on the CPA surcharge so that we maintain that 3%. And so we want to inform the CPC as to our intention to ask for the surcharge as a key part of financing wastewater but it doesn't impact them. And so we went in front of them so they could be prepared to um, ask for what they want to ask for, what they think they need on the CPA side of things. Yeah, I believe it's not only just a town meeting, it's also a ballot vote oh, that right. follows after that as well within so many days. So it'd be a- It's uh, a multi-step process. Two questions potentially at town meeting, one to adopt the water infrastructure fund, 
assign the percentage, another article to amend the CPA surcharge if, that, if you're inclined to do so, both followed by a ballot vote. When would that ba ba ballot, ballot vote take it effect? Was, it could be this fall. Yeah, there's a, uh, as it turns out, we have a DPW facility on a potential vote at our upcoming town meeting in October, which would require a ballot vote, which I think is scheduled for election day in November. Um, and so if we needed a vote on this, we could probably put it in on that as well. So Kathy is, with the planning, when she puts together articles for inclusion in town, there's a certain amount of time that it takes to put those articles together and we on the planning board approve them or agree with them and then they go to the board of selectmen. How much time, I mean, and it also has to go to uh, town council too, right? Yeah, typically town council reviews all warrants. So, so the question is, if you're putting four or five articles on the town meeting, when is the, the last time that you can make these recommendations to the Board of Selectmen, give them time to review it, chew it up, and get so town I've, council approval and get it ready to go on the town meeting if the town meeting is in October 29th? So the bigger issue really is, along with all those considerations, is what's the timeline you have to advertise uh, a couple weeks before the town meeting and send out your and before that you've got to have time to print that and get it to the printer and they've got to have time so as you work all that back we're talking mid-September and so I already have drafted and that's why I haven't sent you yet but you'll get it tomorrow um, for your discussion at the Water Resource Advisory Committee next uh, September 3rd I believe it is um, if you're inclined to make a recommendation to the board you'll have the information on the infra water infrastructure fund and what the associated articles and I've taken the liberty of drafting an explanation of them, which people can edit if they'd like. But you'll have that um, tomorrow. So there's not a lot of time. I, but there isn't a lot of time. The question also is, would any of these agencies, like the planning uh, committee, would, they, uh, would it be helpful for them to make a recommendation, receive what you, you're proposing to the selectmen for a town meeting? And is there any advantage to having, say, the planning committee receiving it, reviewing it, and making a recommendation separate to the, to the Board of Selectmen? Well, it's up to the planning board, I guess, if they want to take that vote. The information certainly is going to be made available to you. Uh, as I start pulling this up together, I'm going to make it publicly available, obviously. And, but specifically, I'll send it to you know, the, the core committees here in town that we have the interest in, in what's happening. I just think it would be advantageous for the public at large to understand that the planning commission is behind this program and I, I would I would echo that too um, uh, Lee um, and um, I don't know uh, mr. chairman if we have uh, if we don't have a quorum tonight if we can at least give a sense of the uh, of the meeting uh, vote uh, in, uh, in about the subject of moving forward on this. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll just take a consensus at this point. Do um, you think it's sh we should vote on it at this point? I can't get my mic to turn. Well, you probably ought to have. Uh, it's not on the agenda. Yeah. No. As a vote. Plus, um, we do have quorum. We need four people to have quorum. Okay. Um, but I but think it's, it's such it's an important item, and this is the first time that the planning board has actually seen it. And we have some other information to talk about with regard to build-out projections. I think it's a lot of information to digest and to make a an educated vote for tonight. It's certainly something that we can talk about and have available prior to um, this you know, the special town meeting. Uh, my understanding is the special town meeting was changed to October 22nd. That's yeah. the date that I'm working from now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 would, I would defer to the uh, idea of the next meeting, but um, that uh, we, should, we should have that as one of the items on our agenda. In the past, the planning board has sent drafts to the selectmen recommending specific articles at town meeting floor, and I'm sure that uh, we can get to that point uh, when we discuss it. And perhaps the planning board could work with the, uh, the Water Resource Advisory Committee as to their recommendations. And you bet. 
Um, uh, you, were, you were beginning to mention before uh, about um, um, the future loading uh, and the idea of the uh, build out uh, that Kathy uh, presented at, um, at the Monday meeting. Um, but I think, the, I think if, Kathy, if, would you be good enough to give a little um, rundown of, of the, of the build-out for the, for the benefit of the uh, uh, audience? I, I'd be happy to. In your, in your packet, you have the memo that was sent to the Water Resource Advisory Committee and also a, um, a spreadsheet that has a couple tables on it. Um, before we get to the spreadsheet, I'll just kind of... Um, go through, the, go through the, the memo itself. As everyone's been saying, it's really important with the 0% um, state revolving fund that we develop a reasonable build-out number because we're gonna have to live with that and we don't want it to be too low and impact our economic opportunities in the future, but conversely, we don't want it so large that it's gonna have cost implications at the wastewater treatment facility and the collection system and it's unreasonable. Um, and the initial build-outs that had been done was based on the Massachusetts Estuary MEP program that had a certain amount of build-out in it for Lewis Bay, Parkers River, and the Bass River. And then there was an additional 300,000 gallons per day of an allowance just added on to that for further development. So it basically resulted in a total of 576,000 gallons per day available for additional growth within all of the different sewered areas. Um, since the MEP was done, we've, we adopted the Village Center Overlay District, which is a fairly liberal zoning um, amendment that's been implemented, um, as well as we had the UMass Donahue Institute that had done their economic de development analysis and identified that we really had a lot of pent-up development. So because of those two things, it made sense to let's take another look at our build-out projections from previously and see if that $300,000 allowance was really what we need. Our basic approach was to just accept the MEP original um, build-out number um, and look really looking at that 300,000 allowance by looking specifically at our high-density zoning uh, areas. So on Route 28, that was let's look at the parcels in the Village Center Overlay District and let's also look at the properties that are part of the HMOD1, the ho motel properties on Route 28. And we also looked along um, South Shore Drive, which is in also in Phase 1 and is part of our HMOD2, which also has some fairly liberal zoning. Um, and just it needs to be clear that not all of these lots were assumed to take advantage of this very liberal zoning. We took a lot of different criteria into consideration when we evaluated uh, what potential projection there would be. Um, some of the things were to take into consideration were the size of the lots. Was there a lot of contiguous lots owned by the same person? Wha was it in a flood plain, which might make some development um, more difficult? Did it have a lot of wetlands on the parcel? Was it already located within a growth, uh, growth incentive zone so you didn't have to deal with the capability? Commission in the DRI process? Um, was it a property that already had some development agreements on it, like the Red Jacket and the Blue Water? Um, and also, you know, properties that did have a water view, we said, okay, it might be worth putting some money in and redeveloping that because you're going to have a, a nice property at the end. And then just general staff knowledge of, of property owners and developers who have come to us over the years showing a repetitive interest of redeveloping their property, um, and taking all of those things into consideration when estimating some potential build-out on, the, on these lots. Um, we also took a look at lots that should be sewered due to their known potential development opportunities but, but may not have been included originally. This includes the um, Yarmouth Housing Authority parcel off Forest Road, which hadn't been included, and that has uh, been shown as being for senior housing and or maybe some affordable housing project at that location. Um, also, if the Mattakees Middle School property moves to Station Avenue, that really opens up a large potential uh, for, for that property to be redeveloped into maybe some type of congregate living. We, we made some assumptions on that. And the last one was the Village Green Motel, which is located just off of South Shore Drive, and it's in the HMOD too, but for some reason that hadn't been sewered, and it kind of made sense to add that in. And then lastly, we tried to include a flow allowance for some additional bedrooms for expansion of existing homes. The MEP looked at if you had a vacant lot, applying some type of build-out growth to that, but there really wasn't anything that we could find, like if somebody wanted to take their two bedroom home, turn it into a three-bedroom home, or we had this whole discussion about accessory dwelling units, you know, whether people want to start um, doing accessory dwelling units, which would add a, a, a bedroom. So, and, then, and kind of the last thing to keep in mind is that although we did assign specific um, allocations to properties to help us with the build-out projections, no sewer allocations have been specifically assigned to any lot. 
It's just to help to identify the different the fl build out flows in each watershed for our projections. Um, Ultimately, I think the flow allocations will be determined by new sewer use rules and regulations, which the town's going to have to develop and, and adopt. Um, so looking at the, the spreadsheet a little bit here on table, table number two is a summary of the additional build out. And that looked at all the different vi villages. Um, the ho if you were a motel within one of the village center overlay districts, you got included in the VCOD. So then there was the HMOD properties outside the VCOD, and then the HMOD2 properties. And those you can kind of see, we always start with the water rates, with the water usage rates, and the, and this wastewater has been considered to be 90% of water rates. Um, but any build out projections that we did, we used, um, Title V flows, so that's somewhat conservative um, as well, but we maintained the 90%. And then because we were keeping the MEP, we took that out, so we ended up with having a net additional uh, wastewater build out um, in that column G there of table two. And you can see we went through the VCODs, the HMOD ones, the additional sewer lots, and then the new residential bedroom lots, but there was also another property um, where we had, it was outside the HMOD1 and VCOD on Route 28, but we knew that this particular developer had come back to us multiple times about a potential 40B on that property, so we added some flow in um, for that. Ultimately, it netted out to an, another, um, a total of 579,000 gallons per day. So when you go back up to table number one, the first uh, row there that says current build out, that's what we have been working on right now, and that's what Rich's projections and the, all the money is based on, which would allow us to have a, a, a flow to the wastewater treatment facility of about 3.25 million gallons per day, and that's that column J, and then column K is showing that that would give us 576,000 gallons per day of build out. If you take the numbers from table two and you add it in there, we end up increasing the flow to the wastewater treatment facility to about 3.54 uh, million gallons per day, but that would give us the 860,000 uh, gallons per day of additional development opportunity. So basically what we're talking about is a net increase to the wastewater treatment facility of about 284,000 gallons per day based on this analysis. It's a fairly detailed analysis and there's a lot of assumptions that go in there. We might get some properties right, but we're gonna get other properties wrong. But it's really a um, kind of a fine-tuned, educated uh, estimate uh, based on all the information that we have. And what we're held to is the overall flow projection. So to your point, if you're right on one but wrong on another, if, if they net each other out, you're still within your your pro full projection. Right. I think Dave mentioned that if <coughs> we overestimated in one watershed area, there is some mechanism to switch it to another uh, watershed area. But it's the total going to the wastewater treatment facility that we're kind of tied into based on the current regulations of the state revolving fund. Yeah, all that uh, being able to move flow from one watershed to another would be laid out in your land use controls. And we've provided uh, examples of other land use controls that have been implemented by um, Town of Harwich recently and then uh, Mansfield, Foxborough, and Norton uh, off Cape. What would, the, what would some of those be again, Dave? What sort of controls? Uh, well, you're managing to uh, either existing flow in some instances. Uh, as Kathy just said, you're including a flow allowance, so if somebody wanted to add an additional bedroom, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's more water, but by code you have to do certain things. Uh, so theoretically you would be increasing that. You'd have to f come up with a plan as to how you're allocating those additional, I think it was 1,000 bedrooms that you're putting an allowance in for. Uh, which watersheds, or is that town-wide, you know, how that would all be implemented. Well, uh, some of the other communities have locked in uh, water use to a certain date, um, and so that's what that property w uh, is allowed under those land use controls. Um, and if you wanted to switch flow from one watershed to another, um, or increase, I should say, increase flow in within one watershed, then it's the vote of the uh, sewer commissioners. If you wanted to transfer a flow from one watershed to another, uh, first, you have to get the water sh commissioner's vote, and then you would bring it to town meeting. So it becomes a hierarchy of how uh, authorizing votes to move that flow. 
But here on uh, planning, um, will we have to do anything uh, different uh, within uh, within Yarmouth? Do we do we in planning have to consider uh, new uh, elements for uh, uh, town meeting ourselves uh, in that would um, uh, support the effort by the Water Resources Committee? I think eventually we will need to take another hard look at our zoning. I think we've already been kind of talking about this a little bit. Yep. Um, you know, once the sewers go in and we've got some projects that have been developed, we might want to take another look at the VCOD and say, you know what, maybe we're being a little too liberal now. We've got a lot of good, nice projects that we were looking for. Maybe we want to take back some of the, the benefits that we have in that, or maybe make it a slightly smaller area. So yeah, I do think eventually we'll have to do something with zoning, but I think initially it's those sewer rules and regulations that are really going to be the key, because someone's going to need to be accepting a, a certain project and giving an allocation of wastewater for that project to discharge into the system. Yeah. The, um, the, the thought that um, occurs to me is that uh, um, phase one uh, probably is less critical as far as uh, establishing some of these uh, new controls because af afterward the, fa the, the subsequent phases are, are going to impact the individual homeowners. Uh, Whereas the commercial interests along uh, 28 are, uh, are, a lot of them are, are probably very much uh, receptive to this whole idea of uh, getting that sewer built in the, in the first place. Yeah. Most of the build out that you'll see if it's in the Village Center Overlay di District, HMOD1, HMOD2, and some of, th those are all in phase one. It's all phase, <laughs> it, it is all yeah. phase one. So. Um, I, on the uh, generated revenue, uh, Rich, um, you, you mentioned the, the betterment program, 20%, um, but is, is that prorated? Um, by property, or how? What? What is? What is your mechanism of uh, establishing the, the the betterment? So the betterment Possibly flow. So the betterment program has to be. You know, we wanted to get the concept, or people receptive of the overall concept of what we're trying to do, and get some feedback on that. And I think we've got that there were people receptive to this. And so with that, it gives me kind of the green light to go ahead and now flesh out the details of what that actually looks like. And so the betterment program is a big part of that. Because um, that's going to require some votes and maybe some legislation, which is all normal, so it's not anything overly, it's, it's complex, but it's not anything you wouldn't expect. But what we're considering and what we'll have to ultimately determine is basically a flow based betterment based on wastewater that you're generating. So it's not, so it's not by the length of pipe in front of the, in front of the property. So, in other words, um, we know roughly that out of the total 112 million that the phase one collection system is about 44 million. And so if we want to collect 20% of that, it's about just under $9 million that we want to assess to all the phase one participants um, and collectively. So how does that $9 million get collected? Well, if you're a large restaurant or hotel and you're generating, uh, I don't know, What's a good flow? 300,000 gallons, or five and a half a million gallons per year, let's say, versus a residential home doing 50,000 gallons, you're going to pay a lot more. Furthermore, we want to protect the residential owners as well in our program, and so the idea of an exclusion, and I'm, you know, it's easier to use nice round numbers. I don't know what the exact number is going to be, but perhaps we exclude the first 50 or 70 or 100,000 gallons so that you're not capturing those residential, and it's basically shifting it to those high water and wastewater users or generators. The other um, uh, area is um, um, the short-term rent, uh, tax rental, uh, rental tax, excuse me. Um, um, that applies to the motels and hotels. Uh, the, the Cape uh, and Islands Water Protection Trust also pertains to the uh, uh, motels and hotels. Uh, Yarmouth has more th than any other community on the Cape. Um, do we get the lion's share? So you or, or is that, that going to be the, the big question of whether or not that gets redistributed to other communities? So you've got a couple questions wrapped up in there, so let me parse them out uh, a little bit. 
So yes, hotel and motels are included in the short-term rental tax, but they've, not always, but for a long time have been in Yarmouth. So that's not new revenue. That amount of money, that two and a half million dollars a year we've been generating out of that, has gone into the town general fund as part of the operating budget, we rely on that. So not relying on that for our funding of wastewater because it's already accounted for, so to speak. But what we're talking about is beyond the hotels and motels, what's now on our 6% local uh, tax for rental and rentals is the private rentals, the Airbnb properties, or homeaways, and things like that, and any number of platforms. Those are now taxed, and that does represent new revenue that isn't in our budget, doesn't fund our budget. And so that estimate, um, I used the mid-range of the estimate of about $570,000 of new revenues that are coming to the table. So that's the new piece. So we've always had uh, a rental tax, or for a long time we've had a rental tax, a local option rental tax, which at, is at 6%. Long time on the hotel motels, this year for the first year, now on the private rentals as well, so it's an equal playing field. And then what's new, which goes to the Water Protection Trust, is on both of those now, an additional 2.75% that goes to the state, who then forwards it to the Cape and Islands Water Protection Trust. They've had two meetings, and there's, um, uh, um, I'll let you determine, you watch the meetings <laughs> and you can determine you know, how you see this going, but I attend those meetings to see, to get exactly to your question, how, is the, how are we gonna get the money back? I've determined how much I estimate based if we're gonna get 570,000 a new short-term rental tax locally, I can then therefore project how much we're gonna be sending to the trust, mm -hmm. and so obviously, our goal is to get back at least an equitable amount, and there's, a, I think, a wide range of opinion on that board of how that can happen. But I'm going out and talking to all those board members and tell them what I think uh, to protect Yarmouth's interest. Now, we'll have to fit within the framework of what the legislation allows, and that board will have ultimately is responsible for voting how that happens. But my goal for now is to ensure we get 25% of 3.7 million that's phase one. Anything beyond that, I'll, we'll, I'll work on that one when we have to, you know, 10 years from now when we gotta do something else. Hmm. Or somebody will, it might not be me. I'll sit down. Yes, Joanne. Uh, th thanks again for, for coming. This, is, um, this has been very informative. A couple questions on your presentation, uh, Rich. If I understand the um, phase one and the whole sense of recovery, trying to cover that annual debt service, of 3.8 million, 3.7 million that you've laid out here, the ways you might capture paying for the annual debt service for the amount that we borrow. Where in the presentation are the annual operating costs for the new infrastructure, for labor, for materials and services, for utilities to run the plant? Once you build it, the sewers probably, excuse me, um, the sewers probably, um, should probably be okay, but I'm sure there are, um, not unlike our water system, there are pumping stations and uh, other ongoing pieces of equipment that need to be maintained and, and over, over their useful life. What kind of numbers are you looking at there or don't you know because of the uncertainty of whether we're going alone or whether we're going with partners? So that's exa excellent very perceptive question. Um, that's the next, one of the next upcoming exercises. Um, so you, if you've built the plant and you have a way to pay for it, now you have ongoing operating costs. And so our hope is that we can get to a point where um, you can cover your operating costs just like we do with the water rate, with the sewer rate. We know that's gonna be a challenge, particularly in phase one, because you've built a plant and a collection system that's gonna cover three or four phases but you only got one phase hooked up. Mm. And so is that really pr realistic to expect that to happen? And so that's another challenge that we gotta come to. Um, but we do have estimates of what it would look, be, look like to operate it on a go alone or on a regional basis. Um, Yarmouth saves um, significantly on operating costs on a regional basis. Um, could we have done some work and presented that um, on what the operating looks like? We Sure. but. 
you, you can only do so much, and it's good to get a sense of direction and, and only have to do the exercise once, really. Oh, sure. So once we have a sense of where we're going, we'll have a better, se better sense of how we can address it. Absolutely. I, I, I figured that it's, it's all a matter of where this plant is located um, uh, and, and whether there's one or three. Right. Um, so I, I appreciate that. So I'll look forward to, to seeing those. Um, uh, the, uh, the second question I had um, had to do with what's not included. Um, uh, business owners that I know on Route 6A in Yarmouth Port um, might ask the question, gee, what about us? Um, because that whole section of 6A, I don't think is on, is any part of this. Right, so. So what, and, and, and development in that area, I mean, this is kind of forward, a little bit of forward guessing, I guess, no one has a crystal ball, but there may be options for development there that we're unaware of right now. Um, but if we were to just take Route 6A, as it is now in Yarmouth Port, with all the businesses and um, um, uh, many beautiful inns that have three, four, five, 10, 15 bedrooms. Why are they not included? Why is that not a zone? Um, and what are we thinking about for the future? And even if they were, they're in phase eight, which is roughly 40 years away. Or phase nine. <laughs> um, so this is why, this is where the slippery, part of where the slippery slope comes in. Uh, focusing on phase one, because none of this happens unless you start with phase one. After phase one, you know, we have eight phases because we have to address all the nitrogen sensitive areas in our plan. And we also have the charge of do this, that as inexpensively as possible. So the most inexpensive way is only do where you're required to do it. And so what this is, that's what this represents with the exception of the little piece down here. Um, so you'll notice nothing in here. Um, it's because that's a direct discharge to Nantucket Sound. It's not required to be sewered. It's not going into a watershed. But, and Dave can speak to this with his lots of experience and a lot of anecdotes that can support that experience. I expect once we have a system, people are gonna want it. And that's been what we've heard from other communities. And so these people down here might want it. I've already heard from folks up at King's Way that they're likely gonna want it. Likely people on 6A are gonna want it. And they're all gonna want it sooner rather than later. And perhaps we can accommodate all those needs and desires. Not unless we do phase one, of course. But once we do phase one and we monitor and determine what impact we're having, you know, maybe these phases shift, maybe <coughs> the sewer areas shift, or maybe it expands because people want it which is what the experience has been in Provincetown, Chatham, Falmouth, Barnstable. And so I don't think we would be any different. But with that want or desire, sometimes that comes with a cost. And so other communities have found that the desire to want sewers in their neighborhood has been so great that the residents have been willing to pay a 100% or something close to 100% betterment to get it. So that's why I didn't pre present a financing plan for all eight phases, because it's 40 years out, and I don't know, and it's, we know it's not gonna be this. We know it's gonna be something. Mm -hmm. And who knows how it might end up being financed, because some people might wanna be willing to pay for it. And if someone's willing to pay for it and expand our system, I think we'd be receptive to listening to that. Of course, yeah. And I, so I, and I understand the priority has gotta be where the most dangerous nitrogen loading is. I mean, that's gotta be the number one target that we we go for um, and as a supplement to that how come Yarmouth Port doesn't have a, a lot of nitrogen loading is it the it, some of it has to do with the density right, actually right. yeah the marshes help attenuate the nitrogen yeah. you have less density over there yeah okay. um, less intense use of the land too. Yeah. you don't have the big commercial development that you yeah, do along the south side. We've got some land bank, conservation land too, I guess. Well, you got the Boy Scouts, yep. the Rod and Gun Club, yeah, yep. the other conservation. The Pereira. Uh, the, um, the Pereira, the yep. uh, no, Historical Society sense. owns a lot of land, yep. so. Okay. I think and you, then there's Kingsway. So I think again, you will find, what I, oh, what I say to people is this, 
is all being done for environmental reasons. It's the economic reasons that will help pay for it. Yeah. So, you know, from the environmental angle of it, some of the areas on the south side with the watersheds are more critical than they are on the north side. Absolutely, and as, and as absolutely. Rich said, if we had the money, we could just start building tomorrow and do it all, but of course. we're trying to keep this uh, within reason as we move forward. My, my comment was I think that you'll find that most people in Yarmouth Port would not want sewers because they don't want anything to change. I think of all the public meetings we went to on just some <laughs> corridor improvements on Route 6A, yeah. like the thing you heard constantly. Already got a, they've got a petition going, Kathy. Right. Is have we you seen that? No, I have not yeah, seen that. Yeah, there's a petition. We should talk. To 6A. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> okay. With but what that. I would say for, say the, yeah, that's for the planning. That's planning. Yeah, no, not that, for this. No, not it's this, for the Route 6A corridor improvements that we have been discussing. We had a lot of public meetings on it. And also the zoning is, is very uh, different as soon as you get north. And then you have Old Kings Highway. So I don't really see a lot of stuff happening north, and I think a lot of people who are north of, of 6 don't want to see a lot of changes anyway that sewers might bring. Um, Kings Way is different because they have like 453 units on a very large tract of land um, and a wastewater treatment facility. And mm. they, yeah, they probably Heather Woods, like another, some, yeah. Like Heather Woods and uh, Admiralty Heights. Yes, there you go. Um, so they have a wastewater treatment facility, that, and they don't want to be in the wastewater treatment facility business either. So that's why they're interested in so hooking up. But the vast majority of people, I think, are, okay. they'd like it nice and quiet. <laughs> so let me just, in, one key point, though, because we, there's a couple of things within all that. The north side is not excluded from this. Just look at this map. There's a significant amount of parcels north of Route 6 that are in the Seward area. They contribute to Fallen's yeah, Pond and North sure. Bass River yep. watershed and really impact the Bass River watershed. Yep. So they do have an impact and they are part of the plan, a good portion of them. So that's why I say this isn't a problem that 10% of the population of the Yarmouth is experiencing. Two thirds of the homes in Yarmouth are contributing to this problem. Yep. So you know the one third that isn't tends to be up north of six off east, uh, west side of 6A of town. But what we're trying, to, and so one of the things we've heard is, well, why should I have to contribute to all this? And to Kurt's point, this is all about clean water. Well, do you want clean drinking water? Do you, you live here, but do you go down and eat in restaurants or go to the beaches on the south side? Do you go use the Bass River? Do you want, you participate in this community and you benefit from clean water, our properties benefit from clean water, our tourism industry benefits from clean water in a clean environment. Do we, gen if we didn't have that, would we be generating the millions of dollars of revenue we generate each year from motel, hotel, excise taxes, of which all these participants benefit from because it's reducing their taxes because it's in the budget. So whether or not you're in the sewer area, you're benefiting from clean water. And and the committee's position has been um, everybody's going to contribute to the solution when we're talking about cost recovery, but those that are using it will contribute more. Yep. So we think that's a fair approach. Thank you. Tom, I just want to, one other thing. Um, with all the f fine analysis that Kathy has done um, on the increase in flow, um, I think that the Planning Commission, regardless of how the Water Resources Committee votes as far as the flows, these additional flows are concerned, I think the Planning Commission should make a recommendation either to add it uh, all or a portion of it or because the future development of the town really lies with the Planning Commission, and it's the Planning Commission that should make a recommendation to the Water Resources Committee as to whether we think it's needed and should be in here now. I think that's a very good point. The way it was left at the RAC meeting on Monday was that um, CDM was going to take these new numbers and run it through their um, <laughs> their machines and to determine what the, the so increased cost would be and how that would be impacting some of these other things. And then Rich, could, once he has that number, could see how, you know, is that something that we might be able to pay for? I don't know whether it's backing into the number. Um, I think 
something that we can pay for, I guess, is what I mean by backing into it. But I think you're right. I think it would be helpful to the RAC to have some recommendation from the planning board um, on that. But I'd like to see the numbers myself yeah. um, to know how, how great of an impact that has. I, I think I think the point there is a, is a good one. I mean, the finance committee will have a voice on this at town meeting, and there will be some formal recommendation or not by them. Um, and I think as a planning issue, this has got to be top on our list. And whether we use the word endorsement, approval, uh, whatever the right appropriate language might be, uh, con you know, f uh, from a from a uh, statutory point of view, we're not like the finance committee where you know we either recommend or don't. But we certainly can make our voice as prominent and as strong as we feel it should be. And an endorsement, approval, whatever we might like to call it, I think would be very uh, important before town meeting. Absolutely. Well, it has to be before town meeting. No, I mean, be, be not not calendaring before town meeting, but before the town meeting. Okay. People know. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? No, okay. uh, but um, Monday, um, this handout that was at the Monday meeting for water resources. I think this is a very excellent uh, handout, uh, and I and I it would encourage the um, uh, wider dissemination of this. I think it's still to be uh, finalized, Dave? Yes. Yeah, but this is, this is an excellent, excellent, um, easy, easy reading um, um, item that uh, would, would carry a lot of the information that we all need to get the general public uh, aware of. Uh, it's, it, it just makes sense that um, the quicker and easier way we can do it and spread this around, um, uh, it, it, it makes all the sense in the world. And to that end, I'll just uh, mention to the, those that might be watching this video now or in the future, um, go to our town website. The Water Resource Advisory Committee has its own page and sign up for our email, our constant contact emailing list on which we blast all these things out and we'll do again, all the stuff we've already done, we're gonna do again. We have over 100 and 35 people signed up now. We'd love to get that to, you know, a few hundred more. And so, all way of getting, yeah. well, the, the cap on the, the subscription's a thousand, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, Rich, we had talked at one point about including this in, like, the water bills. And I got my water bill recently, I didn't get it. I didn't get this in the bill. Are, are we going to be doing that, or is it yeah, going to be? Yeah, I, I just got to make sure uh, I coordinate that with Jeff. Quarter bills go out, uh, water bills go out quarterly. Right. Um, so I got to is, is get that be another, schedule and make sure that um, they're handling that. So you get three, another yeah. bill that comes out before the town meeting? Yeah, you get three months to be, be just be getting it before the town meeting. And I think there's a September bill. I just got mine. Yesterday. Okay. It was August, on a September. rotating schedule throughout town, so you yeah. won't probably get one before town meeting, but other people could. Okay. So we can include it. Yeah, they do have them phased. I think a lot of this information hasn't been finalized, and that's why some of it's not been disseminated that way. We want to make sure we have the right answers and everybody agrees with the information we're putting out there before we yelled out to everybody. And our uh, update to the selectmen on July 30th was really an important step, I think, for you know, not to speak for the committee, but um, we had to get a sense of, uh, you know, were they supportive or not, and, um, you know, as much as indication you get, we think sure. they're, they're supportive, and basically the question comes down to how you're paying for it. Uh, yeah. I think everybody at this point is, for the most part, is recognizing the need and the importance of clean water. So that's really what we're trying to deliver. And if we can demonstrate that we got a practical, realistic way to finance that, I think we got a shot of um, Absolutely. getting passed. Great presentation, as always, Rich, and you gentlemen as, as well with the input. Um, one of the things I think it might be worthwhile to, we talked about phase one continuously, but it's not, we, we haven't talked about the area. What is phase one? Is it from the Hyannis line all the way to the bridge? That's phase one. So people understand and get a... Uh, right, Route 28 from yep. Barnesville to Dennis 
Exactly. And a little sliver down on South Shore Drive, which, you know, if we have to modify things, that might be one of the first things we modify. But if we can do it, we'd like to do it because we want to afford that development opportunity. As Kurt mentioned, we're doing this for clean water. Yep. But if we can do it and have it paid for by economic development, and therefore residential residents aren't having increased taxes, we think that's a win-win. Well, I think you'll see uh, those hotels along South Shore Drive at some point in time redevelop, and obviously they're going to need uh, sewerage, so it will be a, quite a boom for, for Yarmouth. But I, I agree uh, in regards to um, VCOD, some of those village centers. As Kathy had mentioned, at some point, once we start getting lucky with redevelopment, I think we're going to have to look at some of the zoning issues and just redefine what we expect to get in that area. And I think that um, we had looked at this a while back and contemplating sewers coming forward and trying to visualize what we would see going in these areas, like branded hotels and uh, uh, some type of corporate offices and so forth, but I think that um, the, the, the first indication as to people coming forward and what their intentions are on 28 when the sewer is in place, I think will give us a situation where we can kind of expect the future from that point. And in regards to wastewater, we've talked about it on the RAC committee that it's a living, working document. Things change. Technology changes. So we're going out 40 years. We've got eight phases, but a lot of things may change. And for example, phase four, five, six, or eight, whatever, as you alluded to, Dave. So there's a, a, a lot on, on the Yamas plate, but I'm very encouraged relative to the RAC meetings and what we were able to accomplish at this point and hopefully we can continue the uh, momentum. Just to follow up on one of your points, uh, as you know, there, and Kathy alluded to, there's an economic development report that was completed on the impact of wastewater and economic development, and there's a few key takeaways out of there. One of them is that there's at least, and we think that's cons it's conservative, but at least $100 million of pent-up development demand in Yarmouth. Yeah. And I did the math to translate that to what's that impact to Yarmouth, and that would be about a million dollars of new property tax growth for the town. Yeah, Donahue you know I mean? report, I, I believe it was for every dollar spent, you get $15 back. And that was another key point. Yeah. And the other key point, just to put this in context for people, why is all that important? Well, because Yarmouth has had a significant um, decline going back 30 to 30 plus years, where we were closer to 20% commercial tax base, probably you know, 17, 18% range to now we're at roughly 7% commercial tax base. There's been a decline over that period of time. And we have amongst the lowest new growth every year in our property tax base. 0.77% of our tax base is new growth. Other communities, Barnstable, Mashpee, Falmouth, have double that, or almost double that. 1.3, roughly. Um, if we, you know, it might be a lot for us to double our new growth, but if we could get to 1%, that's a significant budgetary impact for the town of Yarmouth, which keep, could help keep taxes low for the residents. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm sure we're going to be discussing this further. And at some point, I think we can draft a letter sent to the uh, selectmen indicating uh, you know, uh, our approval of the project and um, comments that we may have as well. Uh, when is the RAC committee meeting with the selectmen again? I'm looking at that schedule now. I got to go over it with Kurt, but I have, I have to lay out all the selectmen's meetings and yeah. the issues that they want to get in front of them. Yeah, it would be nice if we could have a draft, you know, before the uh, RAC meets with the selectmen again. Yeah, I was, I was just looking online, and the starting in September, there's really nothing listed on their agenda specifically. Oh, good. So it would be nice if, if two things happen. One, we figure out what agendas they want, which sure. issue on, yeah. and maybe they add a meeting or two so they get caught up with this because by the end of September, this pretty much has to be in place. I would also suggest getting drafts uh, from other uh, boards and committees, like you mentioned the Finance Committee, and send those, shoot those right to the selectmen as well. 
Uh, Kurt, um, uh, w wasn't the uh, language for the uh, um, projected uh, town, wa town meeting warrant also uh, scheduled in that September time frame? Well, that's, that's what we think. Be between closing of the warrant and, and town council review if necessary and printing it, it it's, there's going to be some lead time there. So I'm guesstimating about a month. So if it's an October 22nd town meeting, count backwards and yeah. it gives you a rough idea where we need to be. Very good. Thank you. And the warrant would close when? I swear it was September 21st. I thought it was September 21st in the email that went out from Linda Dennehy. That sounds about right. Yeah. It'll be a month, yeah. yeah it was sh much shorter for special town meeting than it is for an annual town meeting. It mm -hmm. seems like the process is a little mm -hmm. sped up. I just was wondering what article might be on the special town meeting that the build-out number would be part of? I don't know. The, Dave, the build-out isn't voted by town meeting. Uh, no, but um, as part of the uh, town meeting article for DHY, I believe there's uh, a preamble, so to speak, being prepared that explains the whole program, the expected costs that would be incurred, and all those things. So even though your town isn't voting that, there's an understanding of this is what you're committing to. Um, so it would be reflected in Yarmouth's share uh, in that write-up. Th that's what I was wondering, where that, that number came in. Yes. Thank you. And in that regard, too, um, just since we're throwing out some dates, uh, it's either September 12th or 19th will be a three-town uh, Dennis Howard Yarmouth um, update on the DHY program status. Um, certainly encourage you to attend just to learn more about it. Uh, but several key committees in all the towns are being encouraged to do that. So, what are the, there isn't a specific date set yet. Uh, no, they're looking um, uh, availability of locations, uh, coordinating other schedules, and this and that. It'll be set uh, on August 16th. I think is the next subgroup meeting for DHY. Um, but those are the two placeholder dates that they're looking at. And those are again, I'm sorry? Uh, September 12th or September 19th at the Harwich Community Center. What time was that? Would that be? Probably 6 o'clock. Uh, typically, they've been at 6 o'clock. Can I get any more questions, comments? Yeah, I was just wondering if the RAC was going to be having more meetings. I mean, you had been meeting monthly. I'm wondering how quickly CDM can get some of that cost information because I think kind of getting an idea of that numbers will help um, formulate the letter from the yep. board of select, or the planning board, excuse me. We're, we're meeting the day after Labor Day, I believe, is our next meeting. Though we do have some public outreach still between now and then. So I guess when Dave, when you guys get those numbers together, you'll just relay them around and... Okay. Yeah, we'll send them out as soon as we have them for you to be looking at, and hopefully that's well before the September 3rd RAC meeting. Okay. Good. We all set? Very good. Thank you so much for your presentation, Rich. Thank you. Thank you. And your input, Kurt and uh, Dave. Thank you. Yes. Oh, really? Yeah. Next item on the agenda is the minutes. July 17th, 2019. Uh, yeah. I move to accept the uh, minutes of July 17th. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Go right on down the line. Board of Appeals, agenda, decisions. You sent them to us. Yeah. Committee updates, board members. Tom, start with you. Nothing to, nothing to offer at this okay. time. Nothing. Lee? Nothing. Okay. Um, the uh, Yamas Municipal Housing Trust was invited to the uh, grand opening of Yamas Gardens. And... Um, we all went over. Yarmouth Common. Yam Yarmouth Common. Well, Gardens is down the right. West Yarmouth, yeah. <laughs> Yarmouth Commons. And uh, the Lieutenant Governor was there, and she gave a nice presentation relative to the need for affordable housing and housing in general relative to rentals. And um, we talked to the principals of Dakota Properties, and 
they tell us that they're going, they feel as though that they can have the, all of the complex 69 units rented by the end of September. And I think the list that they have currently is about 240. So, um, but it was, it was wonderful. We went through the units, the hallways, the storage area, the uh, mechanical, room. mechanical room. Oh my God, <laughs> it was awesome. So, I'm sure that the uh, the other entity uh, in West Yarmouth, community builders, um, will probably be the same. So, yeah, they they um, they may be coming back before the planning board for a minor tweak in order to um, meet some requirements of CHD, CD, CHDC. Oh. The, the state housing people yeah, uh, for the low income tax credits. Just so you know, um, it's nothing significant, but it is something that would need to amend um, the existing special permit that was issued by the planning board. And did, they did make it on the third round. They did, yes. yeah. So that's going forward. Um, board member items, correspondence. You guys get staff updates. I do have some staff updates. Cool. Yeah, um, the Parker's River Bridge, the bids were opened um, on July 31st. Um, it looks like we have sufficient funds wow. uh, and we hope to, um, the Amanda Ruggiero of the new town uh, engineers done an excellent job of looking at the bids as well as um, getting references and, and our consultant Lewis Burge Group hopefully will be writing a recommendation letter soon and we can award it to the uh, low bidder hopefully, which is um, MIG or MIG Corporation, and it's about $4 million for that tiny little bridge. Um, but we're very, very happy. So hopefully it'll get awarded in the next couple weeks and it'll start after Labor Day. Oh, great. Wow. Yeah. Super. I know. Super. That's total $4 million for the bridge? Yes. Wow. Yeah. It's a 30-foot wide bridge. Um, we did have a meeting today um, to talk about the bike study that the Cape Cod Commission uh, has done. Tom, mm -hmm. Tom was there as well um, yeah. in presenting some alternatives and getting some more public feedback. Uh, we have another meeting next Sorry. Wednesday, the 14th at 6 p.m. right here in the town hall hearing room, um, and that will also be recorded so we can show that around to people who aren't able to. Uh, and then I think also we're going to take some of that feedback and develop um, a survey that we can distribute to people asking some very specific questions. You want paved, unpaved, you know, there's a wide variety of questions um, that could be asked on that. Hopefully to have a draft report um, by November and the final report from the Cape Cod Commission by the end of the year. Um, and then my only other thing was to let you guys know that um, with the special town meeting had changed to October 22nd, but there has been some discussion maybe us considering a small zoning amendment for this fall, and it was related to um, community event signs. Um, right now, you can have a community event sign of 32 square feet if you're certain things, um, and, and one of them is nonprofit. It became an issue at the Country Fest, which was even though it's a community event, it was for profit, and yeah. technically our bylaw didn't allow the 32 square foot um, it only allows an 18 square foot temporary. Then they ended up putting a sign on a truck and it was a whole big thing. So I think we need to do a little bit of fixing uh, on that. And I'm working with, um, if you guys are interested in, in pursuing something small like that for a special town meeting, um, Sure. Mark's worked up a little bit of draft language that we, we haven't gone over yet, but I think it's a, I think it's a relatively simple fix to the zoning bylaw, maybe a tiny bit more complicated to the Board of Selectmen's community event sign policy, which would also need to probably have some changes to it. Um, and that's it. We can get input from Mark in regards to his feelings. So. Yeah, he's already done it and sent me an email. I haven't read it yet. Oh, good. good. <laughs> he's good. good. <laughs> hey, Kathy, I had one question on the Parker Road bridge project. Um, Jeff had mentioned something about he was concerned about the, the low bid and whether there was enough money to to do the project. Yes. And the other question I had was coordination for the sleeves for the piping system. Is that all set? Yep. Okay. Two questions. Um, 
th with the money, we have been working with NRCS, who was providing us with $500,000 for the project. We've requested a supplemental of $300,000, and I just got an email before this meeting saying it's looking very, very good that they would be willing to contribute that additional funding um, to the project so that we would have that as our contingency plus some some other f some other funds. So I think I think we do have enough funds at this point. Um, I don't know whether we would need anything on. Uh, I think you talked to you at the RAC meeting about maybe having something on the special town meeting. Right. I haven't. F we haven't discussed whether we would still need that or not if this came through. Um, but it's something certainly worth um, discussing. The only thing that's coordinated with the. Um, with, with sewer for the bridge is that they're going to be um, cast into the side of the beam on the north side is these um, plugs that would allow for the brackets to be attached for a force main on, on the north side in the future. Oh, okay. Okay. And they had to redesign that, that last beam uh, in order to be able to handle that load, which they were able to do. Good. So they'll be plugged for now, so no water will get in there, and then when, when we need to use it for the sewer. There will, of course, be some additional work that will have to happen on either end. Um, I don't know if the uh, moratorium applies if uh, MassDOT didn't pay for the work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, but De details. There, details. there might be some things that need to happen, um, obviously, going from the pump station to the force main, which is, would then be on the other side of the road. We already had a gas main that's attached to the south side, outside of the bridge. Uh, we were fortunate to get all the fiber optics and the water main to be tucked in underneath the bridge. Um, but we couldn't quite get everything under there. So uh, uh, w they're not going to put the pipe in in the road, crossing the road? It's not designed there now, but it's worth discussing to get that in uh, through a change order of some sort. Right. Okay. It's not really designed fully yet, so I don't know what they would they put They could in. put a sleeve, you know, I mean. It, well, it's a force main, so it's not like it's gravity. So it's, uh, yeah, you're right. They could do that. Kathy, you uh, mentioned the, uh, the bike. Um, uh, meeting to, uh, that was earlier today. Uh, m you know, my interest uh, in, in trying to move that uh, issue uh, quicker, uh, primarily because of the funding cycle. If we, if, if you look at CPA money or even the uh, money that's available through Mass DOT, um, um, in order to prepare a proposal, you have to have a plan in place, and we don't have any plan because we don't yet have a, have a uh, uh, an, an actual project or a committee to, uh, to, to, f to further that. So um, the, the, the timing of, of that, I think, is, uh, is, is my main concern. I think what they're do what we're doing now with the um, Cape Cod Commission is actually having some of these public meetings to get public input because this is really the first time the general public has had it, and I think the feedback we get from the survey is also going to be very important to help identify a problem uh, project. I think it's pretty clear from the Cape Cod Rail Trail probably to Buck Island Road. It's not an overly complicated project. Um, there are some there are some challenges and some opportunities there, but it's more difficult from Buck Island all the way down to Route 28. A lot of people expressed today about the real concerns about crossing Route 28 without there being some type of bridge um, or an actual signal, a stop signal. Even with a stop signal, some people had some concerns. I think we need to get a little bit more public. Um, public input, and then of course it all has to go to the Board of Selectmen and see what they think. It's all town land, so they, they would ultimately have a lot of say in that. How, mu how many people did, did you get? Less than, between 15 and 20, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Okay, upcoming meetings, August 21st. Anything in the yeah. schedule? Yes, we will have an A&R um, on then, and I guess I will also put on um, something for, um, the wastewater. Yes. Um, okay. Discussion. Yeah. Further discussion. And possible voter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. September 4th. I don't have anything on there okay. right now. Item 9. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Thanks Thank very you much. very much.